Welcome to the Catalyst Sale Podcast. Whether you are a sales professional, not in sales, but interested in helping people solve problems, or a founder CEO who is looking to grow your business, you'll find practical tools, stories, and experience you can apply to your role. I'm your host, Jody Mayberry, and I'm here with Mike Simmons, the founder of Catalyst Sale. Hello, Mike. Hey, Jody. How are you doing? Well, I'm doing great. You know, I just got back from a conference that there was just something missing. (laughs) Yeah. The person on the other end of the microphone? (laughs) (laughs) Yes. Yes. Now, to give you some backstory, Mike and I had been planning for months to be together at Podcast Movement, and one of the two of us didn't go. Yeah. Yeah. Who's that? I was there. I mean, I'm not going to point fingers, but I will say I was there. You were there. Yeah, that was it. Was uh, it was a tough decision to make? But and as most folks know, we launched the course, so that became the priority. And sometimes, you know, you've got to be able to say no. And we've talked about that before. It's important to to when you're doing the work, do the right work and know what to say no to. And the last minute, I had to say no to podcast movement. And what was interesting about that is one of the people who's speaking at an event that I've got going on here in August in Phoenix, a Disrupt HR event. So and this, and this episode will go live well after that takes place, given that we're, we've are we only got a week or so left in the month. But Evo, he was at an event that I was speaking at. And I had mentioned that he was a local person who was going to be at this upcoming Disrupt HR event. And then he was in the crowd. So then we started talking and we started talking about podcast movement 24 hours after I'd already canceled my flight and I had some serious uh, fear of missing out. Well, for good reason. You missed out. It was I, it, I know. <laughs> it was a great time. It was a great time and I spent time talking with former Catalyst Sale podcast guest Donald Kelly and, yep. and of course we talked about you. But that's okay. Well, uh, let's turn to this episode so I don't keep making you feel bad that you missed out. Yeah. Thank you. uh, What I want to talk about, Mike sent me some very interesting photos from a recent experience that he had. Now, first, let me tell you this. Mike often talks about how cool he is driving his Jeep around, but Mike also drives a minivan. You You should know that. It's not a minivan. It's a Honda Pilot. And uh, no, Jen drives the Honda Pilot. Every once in a while, I'm allowed to drive it. My preference is to drive the Jeep. Okay. Well, I was just guessing from the photos it was a minivan from what I saw. Okay. So why does it matter? I I know I'm just giving you you a hard time, Mike. Why does it matter? Why did you send me four photos of your Honda Pilot? Because I had an experience this morning where... I would say my frustration with Honda, well, actually, I have not even frustration with Honda. It's frustration with the way that some people design things with, all, with great intentions. They design things with some level of practicality built into it, but they don't think of the user experience. And how did that happen? Why, why did your Honda remind you of that? So I'll post pictures in the show notes and we'll promote this as it goes along. And you probably, you may even see me promote it beforehand, but the, and we live in the desert and usually about every year to 18 months, your battery will, will die just because of the heat and the way that and the strain that it puts on, on the battery. Now, one of, I think this might be the reason why Honda does this, but they put the battery at a place in a place in the engine compartment that required, I take parts of the vehicle apart in order to get to the battery just to jumpstart the vehicle. And I had to take a one a cover off, and I know this sounds like we, I'm just thinking of past discussions that we've had about the lack of wrenching that I do on my Jeep and how I take it in to get work done on and all that other kind of stuff. Yes, I do that, but in the, in being able to jumpstart a vehicle, it is something that uh, that I've done before, and 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 I don't know that I'd call myself a professional, but I've but I've demonstrated a capacity to get a vehicle running when it uh, is not running. Anyhow. This in this instance, what I had to do is remove the air intake and remove a cover to get to the battery. And this is a known issue with these Hondas. It's a it's a 2017 pilot. So if you go through and you do a YouTube search to figure out how to either change the battery or jumpstart the vehicle, you've got to go through this process. But when you go through the process, you'll shake your head and wonder how did Honda Engineering decide that this was a good thing? That this was this was going to be a, provide a good experience for people, especially when you think of the people who are going to be driving these pilots or these minivans. 
and the challenges they might run into when they get themselves into a situation where they need their car jump started. This is a, a good way to look at it because when Mike started telling me about the design, there, sure, there's a reason that it's designed this way, but it doesn't work for the user. I started thinking, gosh, that's true in cars. It's true in lines. You know, when you uh, most, a lot of places when you wait in lines, think about if you've ever waited in a line that blocks something else or processes, there's so much that design for user experience or lack of user experience. This Mike taking apart his car to jumpstart it has just opened up a lot of ideas of where we could be wrong. Now, I took away a question I was going to ask you, Mike. I was going to say, why does that matter? I may have already answered that, but why does that matter to us in business, this idea that you had to take apart your car to get to the battery? Yeah, and it's not really even the the me having to take apart the car. And I know we're kind of, we're, we're building the story out you know, in, in a way to to help kind of demonstrate impact. And there's going to be some people who are listening to this and be like, dude, you had to take a, you had to take a couple of screws out of something take a piece off of the vehicle, and then you were able to jumpstart the car. But what if you're in a situation where you don't have a screwdriver? And I don't know how many people drive around with a screwdriver. I've got some tools in my Jeep because I know that every once in a while things break and uh, you can be prepared, but not everybody's going to be in that scenario. But drawing this back to business, so connecting the dots back into business, think about any time that you create this experience for your customers, and because you've worked inside the product so many times, or you've worked inside the operation so many times, these things just become second nature. It doesn't feel like there is a lack of efficiency or a better way to do it because you are kind of in a mode or you're in a rut or you've got these blind spots. Well, if you take the time and step back and start to think practically about how people apply these things, how people might do something like jumpstart a car, how people might do things like work with your product or share your product with others. If you empathize with the user, put yourself in their shoes, you can identify so many challenges that you may not have considered if you're focused purely on moving something from point A to point B. And one of the reasons why I think the battery is put where it is, is that it helps to keep it cooler. It makes sense where they located it. A way that they could have improved the experience, they could have done the engineering thing, keep the battery in the place where it keeps it cooler, but they could have had another area, some kind of a connection, an area, and this is my lack of technical aptitude with both electricity and automobiles, but they could have had some had leads where you could use those leads to jumpstart the vehicle and it would overcome this issue. But I think the problem that we have in business is sometimes we get so focused on the outcome, so focused on the result, that we forget about what the journey looks like that the customer goes through and what the experience looks like that the customer goes through when we're, when we're designing these things. I think that's key. We're so focused on the result, we forget what it's like to go through to get there. And, and it makes perfect sense to do something like put the battery there. It makes perfect sense to put a process in place because of a result you need or to put your line queue in a place because it gets it out of your way, for example, or it keeps it away from a, a door. It doesn't matter. Yep. But that's all we're doing when we do that is look at a result. Like we need this to happen and we don't focus on the customer. Now, I also know. A lot of times that's not done intentionally. It's not like, oh, we don't care what the customer has to go through. It's just right. that we simply didn't think of it. We didn't that's right. realize how this, whatever this is, how this may impact what happens when a customer actually uses a product. Yeah. We don't actually put it through the paces because we're so close to it. And this is why user experience testing is so important and why human factors is a big deal and why you go through these watching an organization or watching people go through use cases and you just observe. You don't actually interact. You don't engage. You just sit back and observe and watch the workflow, watch how things move along. And, and if you can detach from the scenario, not be in the moment in when you're doing the work, if you can detach from the scenario and observe from a different perspective, it's amazing how you can reduce those blind spots and create a better user experience for those who are engaging with your organization, who are engaging with your product, who are engaging 
with your service. And I I know if if when I look at myself, anybody that has made it easy to do business with them, I'm more likely to continue to do it. If there's a product I need and one makes it easier, it's you're more likely to go that route. When it comes to sales, Mike, where are some of the areas that we may have designed without thinking about the user experience that that you want to remind us, hey, step back and take a look at this? Yeah, I think uh, you know a lot of times we'll talk about sales process, and you know, there are a couple of lenses that you can look at sales process. One of them is the process that your rep or the individual rep goes through as they execute on things, and we've talked about this in the past about you identify the customer or the prospect, you engage with that person, you establish clear objectives, you then call them to action, and that looping process of calling them to action moves into another engagement and another set of objectives and another call to action. And you continue this looping process and move things forward. But sometimes what we'll do is we'll say that the sales process is actually something like the stages that we've defined from a catalyst sale process perspective. And those are two different things. One is focused on forecasting and creating predictability and revenue. The other is around execution from a rep perspective. Those are both internal items, one, you know, one focused on the organization, one focused on the rep inside the company. And then you get into, well, what's the customer experience? What's the decision process that the customer has to go through on their end? How do they make a decision to purchase? How do they navigate the process inside their organization to buy the resource? And there's a distinction between a decision to purchase and going through the process of buying. In some of the more transactional things, those overlap. In some of the more highly complex, very expensive items, they may be disconnected and require more people. So any of these, when you think of them as gears, any of these gears that we add into the equation, if those gears are out of alignment, we create a situation where there's more friction. If those gears are in alignment and they're well lubricated, we reduce friction and we make it easier for organizations to work with us. So. A mistake that we make is sometimes we look at the problem through the wrong lens. We look at that problem through the lens of maybe the lens that's really important to us as an individual rather than the lens that's important to that is, you know, considering things from the perspective of the client or considering the perspective of the business. So if we know that uh, you've, you've brought it to our attention, we know, okay, we, that we've bound to have places where we've designed for us and not the customer. How do we begin to identify where that could be? I think the big thing to do is just ask people to go through and do and and do the work. In retail, you have secret shoppers and they go through the process of buying. In some instances, and they had the, I think, the, what's the show? Undercover Boss, where they would put the boss undercover and, the, and they'd act as a a frontline employee for a couple of days, and then they, they'd be eye-opening to see the different experiences. I think this just gets back to those fundamental foundational items, which is walk around, be embra- embrace the operation, engage in the operation, ask questions. And when you ask that question, listen with intent. Don't listen with the intention to confirm biases that you've already created. Listen with the intention to understand and potentially shift perspective. So ask questions, listen, and reflect. Well, I think we maybe are guilty more often than we think of of doing what Mike just said, where we ask questions just to confirm what we already believe. That's a challenge, Mike, to be so open when you ask questions and you listen that you're not just trying to pick out the pieces that confirm what you're looking for, but that you actually listen and then can move towards a better user experience. Well, think about it. We want to be right, right? You know, like we want to be we want to be validated. We want to validate that we understand what we're doing. We want to validate that we're thinking the right thing. And that validation can create biases and blind spots. And I think one of the biggest challenges organizations run into, and I know this is a theme that comes up on the podcast often, are these blind spots. And blind spots are real. Whether you go to the the eye doctor and they illustrate to you that you have a blind spot, or you're in your car, bring you back to the car, and you and you you look over the corner and you can't see that person, or you look out through the mirror and you can't see the the vehicle in the lane next to you. We have these blind spots, and the the 
only way to overcome those blind spots is to shift your perspective. And you can shift that perspective through the questions you ask. You can shift that perspective through the folks you engage with, or you can shift that perspective by moving into another area and looking at the problem through another lens. So there's ways to address blind spots and it requires a shift in perspective. Yeah, this this is a great conversation. And I don't know, maybe I pushed it a, a little, I promoted the story a little too much about all the work Mike had to do. He really removed like one piece from his car, but I, w- I was making, trying to make you feel sorry for Mike, but I don't- there were, it w- Hey, Jody, there were, four, there were four screws that I removed and in hindsight, I only needed to remove two. So I doubled my effort for no reason in that process. And really, I mean, this is one of those things. It took a couple of minutes, but you just, the worst part about it is I'm just imagining a situation like, hey, how many times, when's the last time your battery went dead in your car? I actually had to jumpstart my car yesterday, but it turns out it's not a battery issue, but I had to jumpstart it yesterday. And where were you when you had to jumpstart it? In my driveway. Okay. What if you would have been in a parking lot? See, if I'd been in a parking lot, that'd be a di- if I had to remove screws because I'm in a parking lot, I would not be happy because, you know, parking. <laughs> and then what if you parked in a parking garage and your hood is facing the wall? Oh, yeah. I mean, there's so many different, so many different ways. And I, again, we'll show the pictures. So not to harp on this, but it just, it's an example where a, an organization like Honda, who's well known for their engineering and great vehicles that they built. This is the third pilot we've had. But but this is what we're like, wow, that one got past the goalie. <laughs> yes. Okay. Well, then if, if we uh, wrap all this up, I, I know we've maybe at least in the beginning, this, this episode's had a little bit of a negative tone and Mike and I are both positive guys, but extremely. Sometimes, extremely, sometimes you have to bring things like this forward to have candid discussions about it. So Mike, let's, let's end this on a positive note. When it comes to designing for user experience. Tell us some some good things. All right. So think of any time that you've gone into a store, you come up to a door and the door has a handle on the outside of it. Do you think that you should pull that handle or do you think you should push? Uh, you know, I don't, I don't know anymore. I think, I think I probably now expect to push, I mean, pull on the way in and push on the way out. Well, and there's a a cool way that you can address this from a design perspective. And I'm forgetting the name of the book, but we'll have a link in the show notes. So this will. So now you have to go to the show notes to get the link of this book. But it was something. It's around design, designing for everyday experiences. But you know, imagine if that same door instead of a handle just had had nothing on the handle, just had an area where you could push. And now all of a sudden, that door now is communicating to you that when you come up, you don't need to waste the brain cells to figure out do I push or pull. I'm just going to push because it's the only option. And then on the other side of that door, there's a handle just to pull. So I think that there are instances, and I don't know if this is, this is a great way to end on a positive note, but I'll say there are instances where people have put a lot of attention into designing for user experiences and instances where they don't require that the person does any thinking on their side. So if you can reduce the amount of friction that your customers have to go through. Friction could be this thinking piece. And sometimes thinking is good. Like we like, we have sales as a thinking process. So we like to think. But if you can reduce the amount of thinking that your customer needs to go through when using your product, you can create experiences that are significantly better than your competition. So next time you're walking into a store, take a look at the handle and figure out, you know, is, is it designed based on the idea of motion or is it designed in a way that makes you kind of question, do I push or do I pull? There's some great resources. Like, uh, you know, I think the iPad and using an Apple Pencil is a great, is a really good experience. I mean, it just works. It's easy to, easy to interact with. I'm able to do some digital whiteboarding with those tools. There's a certain kind of uh, flask or water bottle that I like to use, the Hydro Flask uh, water bottles. Their, their bottles are designed really well. They're easy to use. And you think, well, how could a water bottle be difficult to use? When you find something that just feels right, like you and your G2 pen, if I'm remembering right, your G2 Uh, pilot pen, you'll get into a situation where something just feels right and it's just easy to use. And and you don't even think about going and changing to something else. So I'll leave it with the asking the audience to think about those experiences that just work really well where there's little friction 
And how can you create similar experiences for your customers, for the audience you serve, for the folks inside your family? Figure out ways to reduce friction. I love it, Mike. I'm going to give you one example that I just saw that I've only seen now two times ever. We were at the Grizzly and Wolf Discovery Center in West Yellowstone, Idaho. Okay. I went into the bathroom, washed my hands. I'm on the way out. And what's one problem most people think, maybe not most, I think people do. What do you think about when you're on your way, you just washed your hands and now you have to exit the bathroom? Is there a trash can close for me to use a paper towel when I either open or close that door? Exactly. And coming from a park world, I always would preach in parks, keep a trash can close to the door. Otherwise, you're going to get paper towels on the floor. But yep. somebody in their designing for user experience, they put a like a toe hold at the bottom of the door and you could now open this door with your foot. And I thought that's perfect because a lot of people don't want to touch the door handle because not everybody washes their hands. Oh man, I'm really taking this episode somewhere. But a lot of people don't want to touch the door handle on the way out of the bathroom. And now somebody designed an experience where you don't have to worry about that. So just think about it if they would have designed it slightly different. And Grant, we are not, we're not instructional. I, excuse me. We are not what are these, I was going to say instructional designers, but the we are not industrial engineers. At least I don't, I don't think you've been an industrial engineer. You're you're more of a finance guy and a park guy and a podcast guy, right? Yeah, no industrial engineering here. All right. So imagine if, so think of we, when we go into, a, into that bathroom, we don't want to touch that coming out. We don't want to have to touch the handle without being able to throw a piece of paper towel someplace else. So what if the scenario was reversed where you, every time you walk out of the bathroom, you push the door open. And every time you walk in, you pull the door open. I mean, your hand's still going to touch something or your foot's going to touch something, but now it's an instance where you're not all grabbing at that same place. I don't know. Yeah. Well, there, see, that that just opens the, the discussion of, yeah, if it was designed differently from the beginning, maybe you wouldn't need to open a door with your foot. But you missed an opportunity, Jody. I thought you said that just opens the door to a whole nother discussion. Oh, my goodness. That would have been, <laughs> I should have just walked right through that door and I didn't. That was such an opportunity. Yeah, it was. And you know, I have no idea if this is a problem that ladies have or if it's just men. Are we the only ones that worry about door handles? I really don't know. You know, the last time I made the mistake and walked into the wrong restroom, I was not paying attention to whether or not there was a waste basket by the door when I walked out. I was more focused on getting out. Yeah, me too. I have a, I have a whole story around that, which I know you know, Mike, but we, we're going to have to end this episode before I tell that story. So Mike, if we, if anyone wants to reach out and say, Hey, I've thought about user experience, or this is something we do at our organization and they want to share it with you, where can they get in touch? Best place, go to catalystsale.com. You can find everything about what's going on inside the organization. You can go and engage with me directly through our live chat, which is connected to our HubSpot instance and uh, Slack. Always reach me on Twitter, Simmons underscore M or on LinkedIn, which is just Mike Simmons. And if you do a search for Mike Simmons or Mike Simmons Catalyst, you'll find me on LinkedIn. All right. Wonderful, Mike. Thank you so much. And thank you for listening to the Catalyst Sale Podcast.